Hey, party people. Um, this is a entry from uh, a critical companion to the Russian Revolution. Um, yeah, critical companion to the Russian Revolution, nineteen fourteen to nineteen twenty one. The entry is about factory committees, and it's by Stephen A. Smith. Um, and he's done a lot of interesting work on this subject. Now, I've lost my place somehow, and I'm going to try to get back to it. Come on, you son of a gun. There we are. All right, we're getting there. Okay, there we are. Fine. The origins of the factory committees. The overthrow of the Romanov dynasty in February 1917 was seen by workers as a signal to dismantle the autocratic regime in the workplace and replace it with a, quote, constitutional, end quote, order. They began by expelling the most hated foremen and administrators and tearing up the old factory regulations, proceeded to establish committees to represent their interest vis-a-vis -vis management. The speed and spontaneity with which factory committees were created can be explained in part by the fact that they had a long prehistory. As far back as 1820, workers at the Fria Novo textile mill had asked that their elders, Starosti, be allowed to oversee and impl the implementation of factory regulations and payment of wages. From the 1870s, the demand for permanent elected representatives began to appear in strikes. In 1903, the extension of the, quote, police unions, end quote, sponsored by Colonel Zubatov, head of the Moscow Akrana, and the Akrana, I believe, is the secret police of the Tsarist Russia. The government passed a law which permitted workers to nominate candidates from whom the management would choose elders. Inspired by a desire to discourage the development of independent organizations, the law was unpopular with workers, not least because elders enjoyed no le legal immunity and could not summon meetings of the whole workforce, but it was also disliked by employers who resented concessions to the principle of permanent representation. With the outbreak of revolution in 1905, the movement to establish elected bodies of permanent representatives took off. The petition which carrot workers carried to the Winter Palace on Bloody Sunday contained a demand to this effort, to me, to this effect. But it was the decision to set up an official commission under Senator N. V. Shidlovsky to investigate the causes of worker disaffection which catalyzed the movement. On the 1st of February, Shidlovsky invited workers to elect representatives from whom 500 would be chosen to sit on a commission, and in spite of opposition from the more militant plants in the capital, 145,259 workers in 209 state and private enterprises elected 372 representatives. After the disbandment of the commission, many of these representatives transformed themselves into the nuclei of factory commissions. Zadovsky Commissi, or Councils of Elders, Soveti Starost. The latter were so named in order to take advantage of the 1903 law, but they were seldom bound by its restrictions. The committees grew most rapidly in the large metal plants where they gained de facto recognition from management. In some cases, they justified themselves in the fashionable language of constitutionalism. The Patronii plant, the fa excuse me, at the Patronii plant, the factory commission was known as the, quote, Workers Duma, end quote. And at the large Cheshire textile mill, the commission drew up a, quote, Workers Constitution, end quote, 
which codified its right to look into complaints, rewrite the rules of internal order, and be consulted over dismissals. This encroachment in employers' quote, right to manage, end quote, went furthest in the printing industry, where by the second half of 1906, the printers' union had persuaded employers to accept, quote, autonomous rules, end quote, which sanctioned the participation of commissions in matters of hiring and firing, changes in rates of pay and work practices. Generally, however, employers resisted the intervention of committees in the running of the workplace, and with the onset of unemployment in 1906 and political reaction in 1907, the committees fell into disarray. A few, such as those at the as such as those at the Shestrowetsk Armaments Works and the Nevsky Shipbuilding Works in the capital survived for several years, but unlike the trade unions, they did not re-emerge in the strike wave of 1912 to 1914. During the war, the workers' group of the War Industries Committees pressed unsuccessfully to revive factory elders. After the postponement of the opening of the Duma on the 12th of January 1917, the now revolutionary-minded Central Workers' Group called on workers to elect factory committees, and its call was headed a month heated a month later when mass strikes precipitated the overthrow of the autocracy. The first phase of factory committee activity. The committees reestablished themselves most quickly in the then in the ten enterprises run by the artillery administration. Glavno Artillerisko up Rav Leni, and the five run by the Naval Ministry, Morsko Vedomstovo. I don't know if I'm saying any of these right, so you're hearing some butcheries, but, but you'll have to deal with it. I'm sorry. I hope you can find it in your heart. Forgive me. Which together employed around a third of the factory workforce of the capital. The strength of the committees in the state-owned sector may reflect the efforts by the government in 1905 and 1906 to extend the law on elders to state-owned plants, but it was more probably due to the fact that many of the army and naval officers who ran these plants fled during the turmoil of the February Revolution. Left without management, the factory committees, led mainly by social revolutionaries and Mensheviks, struggled to keep production going for the war effort, but linked this concern to a vision of demo a democratized system of industrial relations. As early as the 13th of March, a conference of artillery enterprises called for, quote, full democracy and collegiality, end quote, in the running of production and claimed rights to oversee supplies, orders, and the execution of tasks, to demand access to company records and documentation, to subject to appointments of managerial and technical personnel, and to determine the internal rules of the enterprise. At the Conference of Workers in State Enterprises on the 15th of April, a resolution possibly authored by P.A. Voron Voronkov, an SR member of the Petrograd Soviet and evidently a worker at the new arsenal, defended, quote, preliminary, end quote, control of production under which committees had a consultative voice in all organs of administration and access to all papers and documentations, documentation, but rejected the idea of committees taking responsibility for production. This distinction between, quote, responsible and, quote, preliminary control was to become central to the movement of workers' control of production and distribution in which control had the sense of supervising and checking rather than of taking charge. In the private sector, factory committees acted, initially, as surrogate trade unions, since it took a couple of months for the trade unions to reestablish themselves. The committees demanded the eight-hour day, large wage increases to compensate for wartime inflation, a minimum wage, controls on overtime working, and an end to peace rates. Yet here, too, the committees asserted a modicum of, quote, of, excuse me, a modicum of control insofar as they protected premises, sought out supplies of fuel and raw materials, and, above all, insisted on the right to be consulted on matters of hiring and firing. Indeed, the committees extended their activities beyond the sphere of production, involving themselves in food supply, policing, and education. 
Prior to the revolution of the, Pe the Petrograd Soviet of so excuse me, the Petrograd Society of Factory and Mill Owners, Petrogradsko Obshechevstvo Fabrikan Fabrikantov e Zavadchikov <laughs> PF PSFMO had been one of the most politically supplying sectors of capital since it relied heavily on state orders. On so as soon as the autocracy was overthrown, however, it adopted a program similar program similar to that advocated by the progressist industrialist of Moscow. On the 10th of March, it signed an agreement with the Executive Committee of the Petrograd Soviet recognizing the eight-hour day as a norm. It agreed to the setting up of consolation boards in each enterprise, comprising equal numbers of workers and management representatives, to resolve disputes, and it backed the law, promulgated on the 23rd of April, which legalized factory committees as the workers' representative organs. Outside Petrograd, employers tended to be less convinced that the future lay in such a, quote, Western, end quote, model of industrial relations, kept their distance from the factory committees, and temporized over implementing the eight-hour day. The law on factory committees galvanized their formation across the former empire. Metal workers, especially those in large enterprises, were particularly energetic. But the metal workers' lead was eagerly followed by railway workers, who formed line committees, and miners, who formed mine committees. These committees took on a huge array of functions. At the Nevsky shipyard in Petrograd, the works committee had a militia commission, a food commission, a commission of culture and enlightenment, a technical economic commission, responsible for wages, safety, first aid, and internal order, a reception commission, responsible for hiring and firing, and a commission to deal with correspondence. At the metal works, no fewer than 28 commissions existed, involving some 200 workers, not counting the 60 starosti elected from the workshops. Soon efforts were made to coordinate the activities of factory committees on a territorial basis. In the capital, a council representing 34 factory committees in Nevsky district was set up in May. Though only four such district councils were successfully established. Much more influential was the Petrograd Central Council of Factory Committees, CCF, created by the first conference of Petrograd Factory Committees, 30th of May to 5th of June, which soon acquired national significance. After the All-Russian Conference of Factory Committees, 12th, uh, 17th to 22nd of October, it was reorganized into the All-Russian Council of Factory Committees. Initially, the council concerned itself with wage disputes and with averting factory closures, but it quickly became heavily involved in organizing supplies of fuel, raw materials, and food, and in coordinating workers' control of production on a city-wide and national scale. By October, it employed 80 people full-time in its various sections. In passing the law on factory committees, the provisional government was careful not to formalize a right of workers' control since employers were deeply sensitive to any encroachment on their authority. Yet we should be wary of assuming that workers' control automatically spelt doom to the project of consolidating a bourgeois democratic capitalist order. Vladimir Cherniaev argues that there was a potential for, quote, social partnership, end quote, between factory committees and management during the period of dual power and that workers' control could serve as a, quote, shock absorber, end quote, of industrial conflict. There are well-documented cases where factory committees did perform this function, and more pertinently, their efforts to improve labor productivity were much appreciated by employers. As late as the 9th of August, the works committees of the Admiral Admiralty Shipyard, the New Admiralty, and the Octa, Shell section met with directors, technicians, and foremen, and agreed to transfer to peace rates to boost productivity. Yet by this stage, the economic and political conditions were hardly conducive to, quote, social partnership, end quote, if ever they had been. As the economy slid into crisis, workers lambasted the employers for putting profits before jobs, and employers, 
in the words of the director of the Ubakov works, condemned the factory committees for, quote, introducing the artle, end quote, bracket, team or association of workers, end bracket, principle, with respect to the capital of others, end quote. The Radicalization of Workers' Control of Production From the early summer, a mounting crisis in the economy became evident, the chief symptoms of which were the severe shortages of fuel, raw materials, and food. Coal production in the Donbass dropped from 157 million putty to 131 million between January and May. And the coal that was produced failed to reach the industrial centers as a result of the growing paralysis of the railway system. Shortages spiraling costs, declining productivity, and an increasingly combative workforce made industrialists start to lay off employees, convincing workers that the crisis was deliberately being engineered by the employers. Faced with the prospect of mass unemployment, Factory committees expanded the scope of workers' control in order to preserve jobs and to combat capitalist, quote, sabotage, end quote. Quote, fixers, end quote. Tolkachi were sent in search of oil and coal. Stocks of raw materials were monitored. Access to order books and company accounts was demanded. Employers did not oppose all such activities. In May, the Viborg district section of the PSFMO, agreed that factory committees could seek out raw materials but refused to give premises or to or pay members of their control economic commissions. They particularly objected to the call by the first conference of factory committees for an end to commercial secrecy. At the Langen Sippen works, the committee attempted to stop the payment of dividends to shareholders, pending an inquiry but in general it proved difficult for committees to extend control into the sphere of company finances. Even in the Earls, where the scope of control was far-reaching, only a few committees, such as those at the Kaslinski Metallurgical Works in the Kaistinsky District and the Nedezdinsky Works in the Bogoslavsky District, succeeded in gaining access to accounts and order books. The aggressive challenge to the, quote, right to manage, end quote, made employers ever more intransigent. The PSFMO demanded that M.I. Skobolev, the Menshevik Minister of Labor, take action to curb the committees. On the 23rd of August, he issued a circular affirming the right to hire and fire belonging exclusively to employers. And five days later, Skobolev issued a second circular forbidding the committees to meet during working hours. The circulars provoked uproar in the labor movement, not least because they appeared around the time of the Kornilov Rebellion. From now on, the two sides of industry are at open war. In September and October, well over 1.2 million workers went on strike, including 700,000 railway workers and 300,000 textile workers and Ivanov Ken Eshma. Industrial conflict was probably most acute in the Donbass, where, by the beginning of September, almost 200 mines had closed and nearly 100,000 were out of work. The Bolshevik-led mine committees responded to mass layoffs by organizing occupations of the mines. In some instances, the committees placed mine owners and managers under arrest, as at the Ayasanovsky mine and the South Russian Mining Company, and there were instances of beatings and even murder. In late September, the government sent in Cossacks to try to end the mine occupations. In a few instances, factory committees sought to prevent closures by placing enterprises under workers' management. Such incidents have been seen by some historians, such as Paul Average, Paul Average being a historian of anarchism in Russia, and an anarchist himself, as evidence of widespread anarcho-syndicalism within the factory committee movement. In fact, such acts were fairly rare. One calculation suggests that 2,094 acts of worker control between July and October, only 4.3% involved factory committees taking over enterprises.
Although anarchist syndicalism did increase in popularity after October, most such takeovers were motivated not by a utopian desire to set up producers' communes, but by the hope of forcing the government to take financial responsibility for the enterprise by appointing an official or board to run it, so-called, quote, sequestration. This was true, for instance, of the few cases of workers' management in Moscow. At the Dynamo Machine Construction Works, the Benno Rontaler Button Factory, and the Gonson Wood Factory. Only in the Ukraine did the fervored tempo of class conflict, combined with appalling levels of closure, lead to significant numbers of worker takeovers. In Kharkov, committees took charge of the Gel Ferik Sad artificial agricultural machinery plant the steam engine, and the general electric works. In general, however, factory committees were under few illusions about the difficulty of running factories in the absence of orders, operating capital and technical and financial expertise. Against the background of, quote, excesses, end quote, the Mensheviks and the socialist revolutionaries stepped up their criticism of workers' control of production arguing that spontaneous initiatives by atomized groups of workers could only aggravate the crisis. They insisted that only planned, centralized, and all-embracing control by the state could restore order to the economy. And they maintained that this was politically preferable, since it would allow the entire, quote, revolutionary democracy, end quote, according to the Mensheviks, or, quote, toiling people, end quote, according to the socialist revolutionaries, and not just the working class, to participate in the massive effort of control. One second. Some of the moderate socialists went so far as to accuse the Bolsheviks of deliberately seeking to wreck the economy for political ends, a charge that has been echoed by some historians. The Menshevik Solomon Schwartz, for example, made this charge against the Council of Factory Committees, yet the range and vigor of its practical activities hardly bear him out. Certainly, council leaders had, were determined to break the power of capital at the point of production, but... Council leaders did not subscribe to the view that the worse the crisis got, the nearer they were drawing to socialism. It is true that during the period of war communism, some, such as Bukharin, did advocate such a view. Whether in practice workers' control did make the economic crisis worse is a difficult question that merits further research. Again, the, again, the assertion is frequently made by historians, yet the evidence points in different directions. Whilst there were, quote, excesses, end quote, committed by some factory committees, such as physical attacks on technical and managerial personnel or hoarding of scarce materials, the great majority struggled to alleviate shortages and to keep production going. The Politics of Workers' Control the protocols of factory committees which have been published demonstrate that they concern themselves with practical matters and rarely discussed politics. Nevertheless, members of committees took a broadly political approach to their work and from early on tended to be elected on party slates, illustrating how much more the labor movement in 1917 was subject to political par party political differentiation than in 1905. In the spring and early summer, especially in metal industries, Mensheviks and SRs tended to dominate the factory committees. But as the institutions closest to the rank and file, they soon began to register the radicalization that was taking place in popular political attitudes. By the time of the first conference at the beginning of June, the majority of delegates backed Bolshevik resolutions, although it is doubtful that the Bolsheviks formed majorities in most factory committees at this stage. Even in Petrograd, it was not until the Kornilov Rebellion that Bolsheviks came to dominate most factory committees. At the Lesner Works in September, the Bolsheviks won 471 votes, non-party candidates 186, 
the SRs 155, and the Mensheviks 23 in new elections to the committee. At the Pipeworks, the Bolsheviks had won 36% of the vote in elections in June, but won 62% in October. In Moscow, Bolshevik influence was much less than in the capital. The Moscow Conference of Factory Committees, which opened on the 23rd of July, said nothing about workers' control in its resolution on the economy. Here, too, however, by the time of the second conference, 12th to 17th of October, three-quarters of delegates were Bolsheviks. The first conference of Petrograd Factory Committees was followed by three further conferences of Petrograd Factory Committees between August and early October, and then by the All-Russian Conference, which opened on 17th of October. Bolshevik perspectives on the economic crisis and workers' control were endorsed by all these conferences. Indeed, no less a Bolshevik than Lenin drafted the resolution, Measures to Combat Disruption in the Economy, that was passed by the first conference. This called for a statewide system of workers' control of production and distribution to be achieved by assigning workers' representatives two-thirds of the places in all institutions of economic regulation. This, quote, official, end quote, activity was to be complemented by workers' control at the point of production, especially of the financial and banking operations of enterprises. Lenin at this time believed in the importance of, quote, accounting and inspection, end quote, by workers as a means of combating bureaucratism in the state organization of the economy. But Lenin's resolution had little to say on the functions of the factory committees, making only passing reference to the role in, their role in implementing, quote, real, end quote, control, a task he saw them sharing with the trade unions and Soviets. Significantly, this is Lenin's sole reference to factory committees in four volumes of writing published between February and October. An astonishing silence, given their extraordinary importance. The leading of the CCFC endorsed Lenin's perspective of, quote, state workers' control, end quote, yet they placed a higher value on workers' control, not merely as a prophylactic against capitalist sabotage, but as a preparation for ultimate worker self-management. I'm sorry, but I'm thinking of the uh, episode of Seinfeld where George's parents goes away and he brings the girl over to the house and they come back and they find a condom in their bed. <laughs> and Frank stands is like, well, what is this? A prophylactic rapper? <laughs> uh, anyway, the lead leaders of the CCFC endorsed Lenin's perspective. Blah, 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 blah. No, I already said that. This accent on democracy and production was not shared by Lenin. For Lenin, the transformation of capitalist relations of production was to be achieved at, at state, not enterprise level, and progress to socialism was to be guaranteed by the proletarian nature of the state, rather than by the degree of power exercised by workers on the shop floor. Nevertheless, the significance of such differences was not yet widely appreciated. So far as rank-and-file workers were concerned, the Bolsheviks were the only party prepared to support workers' control, and that was what mattered. The Relationship of the Factory Committees to the Trade Unions The building of trade unions proved to be slower than building factory committees, yet by the time of the third All-Russian Trade Union Conference, from the 21st to 28th of June 1917, there were 976 unions with a membership of 1.4 million, and by October as many as 2,000 2, unions with a membership of over 2 million. The coexistence of trade unions and factories, factory committees led to clashes concerning their respective spheres of competence. At the first conference of factory committees, a majority voted in favor of the committees being separate from the unions, on the grounds that their job, that of controlling production, was different from that of the trade unions. A minority of trade union representatives, however, countered that there was no room for two organizations and that the committee should become the basic cells of the unions. The setting up of the CCFC, alongside the Petrograd Council of Trade Unions, further ruffled trade union feathers 
and on the 11th of June, the Central Board of the Metal Workers Union called unequivocally for the strict subordination of the committees to the unions. The Second Conference of Factory Committees affirmed that the trade unions had the job of defending wages and conditions and of ensuring the implementation of labor legislation, and that the committees had the job of regulating production. At the All-Russian Conference in October, October, trade union representatives accused the committees of being parochial organizations, unsuited to the broad tasks of reconstructing the national economy. Nevertheless, in spite of continuing rivalry, there is evidence that the committees were slowly shifting towards acceptance of a merger with the trade unions in the long term. Moreover, outside the capital and the metal workers in the metalworking industry, relations were much smoother. In the textile industry, for instance, the factory committees became de facto cells of the trade unions even before October, thus adumbrating the relationship which was to come about in January 1918, at the first All-Russian Trade Union Congress. Workers, Militias, and Red Guards From the first, factory committees were active in setting up workers' militias to protect factory premises and maintain order in working-class districts. After a civil militia was established by the new municipal authorities in Petrograd, the executive committee of the Soviet pressed the workers' militias to disband, but the latter were mistrustful of a professional militia answerable to, quote, bourgeois, end quote, authority. After the April days, as the unpopularity of the provisional government grew, armed detachments of workers were created, which took the name of Red Guards. These had a more political character than the militias. Being concerned to defend the revolution against the threat from the right, the Red Guards had the backing of the factory committees and more radical district Soviets, as well as of the Bolsheviks. Badly battered in the reaction which set, off, set in after the July days, the Red Guards received a new lease of life with the Kornilov Rebellion. In Moscow at this time, factory committees sent 209 envo envoys, envoys to the Soviet to demand the formation of a unified Red Guard and weapons to arm it. By October, there may have been as many as 200,000 Red Guards throughout Russia. Most, excuse me, most were fierce supporters of the Bolshevik Party, but in their ranks there were also left SRs and anarchists. Attempts by the Bolsheviks to give the Red Guards a more centralized structure came to little, and this, together with their low level of military training and experience, meant that the party relied principally on the soldiers, of the Petrograd garrison in the October Revolution. However, at least 20,000 Red Guards in Petrograd, of whom 18,000 were armed, took part in the uprising under the command of the Military Revolutionary Committee. They were active in securing bridges and other points on the 24th of October, and played a subsidiary role the following day in capturing the Winter Palace. The Red Guards really proved their mettle in combating the various outbreaks of armed resistance to the Bolsheviks, especially in the Ukraine in February 1918. The formation of the hostile volunteer army, however, confirmed Trotsky in his view that these decentralized and democratic formations would have to give way to a conventional army. The Bolsheviks in power. One of the first measures enacted by the Bolshevik government was the Decree on Workers' Control published on the 14th of November 1917. This affirmed the right of workers in all enterprises to set up control commissions to monitor all aspects of production, have access to all spheres of administration, and crucially to make their decisions binding on employers. It also set up a hierarchy of control organs topped by an all-Russian council of workers' control in which trades unions, Soviets and technical personnel, as well as factory committees, were represented. 
The drafting of the decree evidently caused contention between a moderate Bolshevik, Bolsheviks such as VP Miliutin and uh, you and uh, Lauren it says I you I guess it's an abbreviation I don't know who that I don't know that Bolshevik who were fundamentally unsympathetic to workers' control in situ and favored comprehensive state regulation of the economy and members of the CCF who wished to see rapid progress towards nationalized industry under workers' management. The opening of the archives in the former Soviet Union should allow us finally to determine how far the decree reflected Lenin's views and to clarify the reasons why at this stage he backed the factory committees against the trade unions. The decree did not spell out the nature of workers' control in any detail, mm -hmm. and this proved mm -hmm. to be a bone of contention between the CCF and the short-lived All-Russian Council of Workers' Control. The CCFC consisted, excuse me, insisted that workers' control now meant active intervention in production, whereas trade unionists and moderate Bolsheviks defined it as accounting and inspection and insisted that enterprise control commissions be subordinated to the control distribution commissions of the relevant trade unions and central organs in general. As early as the 26th of October, the CCF discussed with Lenin and trade union representatives its plans for the creation of a provisional All-Russian Council of National Economy, VSNKH, to carry out state regulation of industry. Lenin gave his support to this proposal, and the commission which drafted a decree, a decree on the 15th of November broadly followed the ideas of the CCFC. On the 1st of December, a decree was promulgated which established VSNKH with a remit to organize the national economy and state finance to work out a plan for the regulation of economic life and the coordination of the various organs of economic regulation and to confiscate, requisition, or forcibly syndicate industrial enterprises where necessary. The leaders of the CCFC were well represented at its first meeting on the 5th of December when N.A. Skrypnik was in the chair and N.K. Antipov was one of two secretaries. Subsequently, the structure of the VSNKH was formalized. CCFC representation became less evident. The CCFC also was also instrumental in setting up a Sovnarkoz, Economic Council, of the Northern Region. The setting up of the Sovnarkoz had its first session. Excuse me, this had its first. The Sovnarkoz had its first session on the fourteenth. Excuse me, nineteenth <laughs> of January and was proved and was to prove as influential as VSNKH during the next year, because the CFC played so signal a part in the creation of a centralized apparatus of economic regulation. Some historians, such as Gennady Sklyarevsky have argued that factory committee leaders were always predominantly apparatchiks in embryo rather than genuine representatives of rank and file workers. It is true that some of the CFC leaders, such as VA VIA Chubar, N. I. Derbyshev, or A. M. Kakten, went on to hold influential positions in Soviet administration, but this was not true of the great majority of activists. At the grassroots, the rapidly deteriorating economic situation, together with severe conflict between workers and employers, encouraged factory committees to intensify workers' control. Where employers abandoned or sought to close down their enterprises, control organs did not hesitate to take them over. Anarcho-syndicalist sentiment increased at this time and may have encouraged committees to run things independently of central authority, especially in the mines and on the railways. At the factories belonging to the former minister, A.I. Konovalov in Baniachka and Kamenka in ivanovo Voznesensk province, workers backed the proposal of the anarcho-communist Romanov, to take the factories, quote, into their own hands, end quote, a widely used formula and one often indicative of anarchist sentiment. The local Bolsheviks sent the Provincial Com Commissar of Labor, A.N. Asatkin, to dissuade them, and on the 12th of January the workers agreed that, quote, 
all the pro property of Konovalov should be confiscated for the benefit of the state, end quote. Yet despite increasing anarchist influence, most takeovers remained motivated by a desire to protect jobs. In Petrograd province between November 17, 1917 and March 1918, only 27 factories were taken over, and in nearly all cases this was viewed as a temporary measure pending the transfer of the enterprise into state ownership. Trade union leaders may have looked askance at, quote, syndicalist, end quote, excesses, but were equally critical of what they termed mesnich estvo, parochialism, a tendency on the part of factory committees to collude with employers to protect supplies of fuel and raw materials and to foil attempts by local supply organs to regulate the distribution of scarce resources. This seems to have been one of the key arguments which persuaded the party leadership to back the trade unions against the factory committees, despite the fact that Bolshevik influence within the unions was less secure than in the factory committees. They came to view, however, that only the trade unions, as organizations embracing entire branches of industry, had the organizational and ideological wherewithal to tackle the mammoth problems of economic regulation. At the first All-Russian Congress of Trade Unions, from the 7th to the 14th of January 1918, the Bolshevik, D.B. Ryazanov, called on the factory committees to, quote, choose what form of suicide which would most be, be most useful to the labor movement as a whole, end quote. Uh, David Ryazanov um, uh, uh, went on to be, or I guess at this time may have been as well, one of the top Mark, Mark scholars of his period. Um, but before being um, shot in the terror. His resolution stated that, quote, the parallel existence of two forms of economic, or economic organization in the working class with overlapping functions can only complicate the process of concentrating the forces of the proletariat, end quote, and called for the committees to become the basic cells of the trade unions in the workplace. The factory committees lost out to the trade unions at an institutional level. So, I mean, if the co factory committees lost out to the trade unions at an institutional level, the factory committees may have comforted themselves with the thought that one of their chief aspirations was realized far sooner than they had dared hope. From October, the CCFC had urged the government to move rapidly towards full-scale nationalization of industry, as well as state regulation of the economy. But Lenin was unenthusiastic, preferring to retain a private sector under government supervision and workers' control. In response to the breakdown of industry, however, factory committees, local Soviets, and regional economic councils, Savnar Kozy, took it upon themselves to, quote, nationalize, end quote, enterprises threatened by closure and pressure the FSNKH to make th take them into state ownership. The result was that the party moved much more rapidly than it had intended towards taking industry into state ownership. The factory committees, however, had hoped that nationalization would mean workers' management, yet the government proved less willing to support workers' management. The first Congress of Sovnarkozy decided that only one-third, rather than the proposed two-thirds, of members of management boards of nationalized enterprises should be elected by workers the rest being appointed by VSNKH or its regional councils. Even this was unacceptable to Lenin, who, appalled by the plummeting levels of labor productivity, now called for the restoration of one-person management. Although the crisis in the railway transportation led others to support this proposal, resistance from the factory committees and trade unions ensured there was little progress towards it prior to 1920. By the end of the Civil War, the whole of industry was nationalized, though some small plants were still run by their former owners. The worker-dominated board gave, had given way to one-person management. The factory committees, though still capable of displaying a surprising degree of autonomy, were now integrated into the trade union apparatus. The decree on factory committees issued by the All-Russian Central Council of Trade Unions and the People's Commissariat of Labor in 1920 
laid down that it was their job to maintain labor discipline and increase labor productivity, and, to categor and it categorically forbade them to interfere in management orders. The idea of workers' control continued in an attenuated form, but it was now deemed to be the job of the workers' inspectorates, trade union bodies responsible for monitoring affairs in critical sectors such as rail, tra rail transport and food supply, and the state control organs responsible for auditing the affairs of government departments. The ideal of workers' management had been consigned to oblivion. In 1919, only 10.8% of enterprises for which there is information had been run by individual directors, but by the autumn of 1920, this had risen to 82%. How far this outcome was determined by the terrifying problems thrown up by the imploding economy, and how far by the Bolsheviks' deep-seated preference for centralization and technical expertise remains contentious. Thanks for listening.